satisfied sinners. I'm thinking tonight of a young mother I used to see pushing a baby carriage up in Harlem, and it bothered me because she had black and blue marks on her. And she stopped me one day and said, aren't you the man working with drug addicts? I said, yes, ma'am. She said, then, sir, you've got to get to my husband, Hector. He's one of the worst drug pushers. He's a maniac. He beats me up. He abuses the baby. He's going to kill us. Please, get to him. Now, we usually don't work like that. We prefer they get desperate and come to us for help. But out of pity for that mother, we went to Hector and told him about our program and said, when you get desperate, come and see me. And a few weeks later, in a point of desperation, Hector came. We took him into the program. It lasted eight months to a year. And while Hector was in the program, in a rehabilitation program, I'd see his wife, Carla, in the streets. And she'd say, how's Hector doing? I'd say, Carla, we're going to send a new man back to your home. He's going to be the father and husband he should be. He's going to have love in his heart. And friends, that's exactly what happened. Eight months later, we sent Hector home, a Bible under one arm and a box of candy under the other. And I'll tell you, it gave me joy to know that we were sending a young man home that wasn't a maniac. Now, he wasn't a drug addict. He didn't smoke. He didn't drink. But more than that, he said he was going all the way with Christ. I felt so good about it. Two weeks later, I got the shock of my life. I was walking in a back alley, worked with some junkies, and there's Hector on the corner, on the curb, dirty, filthy, back on the needle, worse than ever. I was horrified. I said, Hector, what in the world happened to you? He said, why don't you go home and ask my wife, Carla? I said, what do you mean? He said, David, I went home determined I was going to live it. He said, but you know, I got home, my wife's a chain smoker, and it bothered me. I said, look, Carla, I, I can quit drugs and smoking. I can expect you to quit blowing smoke in my face. I want you to quit smoking. And I want you to quit running around with all those wicked housewives on the block of those parties. And I want you to quit drinking. She blew up at me, he said. He's, she said, who in the world do you think you are? Why, you dirty, filthy sinner. You come in here now and get a little religion and come in here and start preaching at me. She said, you make me nervous. I don't like you like this. I like you better the way you were before. And boy, she started henpecking him and henpecking him for two weeks trying to seduce him back to the needle, and went out finally and bought two bags of heroin, threw it on the kitchen table with a set of work, said, shoot it up. I want you back the way you were. He said, David, I couldn't face it myself. I need help at home. I couldn't fight it alone. And to this day, I don't understand why a young housewife in Harlem prefers a drug addict crazed husband to a man of God. And yet, see, Carla was satisfied in her sins. The light that he'd received condemned her darkness, and she'd have nothing to do with it. I'm thinking, too, of another uh, situation when I had heard of a young boy living like a dog in a basement. They described it to him, and I couldn't believe it. A 17-year-old boy whose parents had died when he was 12 years old, he'd run away because he didn't want the welfare department to put him in institution. He found an old tenement house a dilapidated tenement house, and the superintendent let him sleep in the basement if he'd do some chores and take care of the furnace. And the boy was 17 years old when I found him, a heroin addict, and I went in the basement, a dark, dirty, rat, and roach-infested basement, filthy, damp, and dark. And there in a corner, he had it fixed up like a little room. He had a pile of rags that he slept on. He had a calendar on the wall that was two years old, a picture of his mother, and a candle. And this was his room. I looked around, and there he was, sitting over in another corner, high as he could be. His eyeballs were yellow. He was full of hepatitis and jaundice, 17 years old, an animal. He hadn't bathed in months. He ate junk food, robbed and stole for money to support his habit. We picked that boy up. I couldn't believe that in America we had kids living like dogs. I picked him up. We put him in the car and took him to the center and cleaned him up. Uh, the cook got him a good hot meal, the first hot meal he'd had, I'm sure, in months. Took him into the chapel, showed him what Christ had done for other junkies. He, he said, I want to try. And friends, that night at midnight, we put Manny to bed in new pajamas, beautiful clean sheets, nice downy soft pillow, and two boys to stay up with him all night to help him kick cold turkey, wipe the sweat from his brow to pray with him. And I'd been gone a few weeks and went down to my office after putting him in the room with the boys and I was dictating some letters in the dictaphone machine. About 2 o'clock, I flipped it off and leaned back in the chair, 
And I thought of that boy up in that room. And I thought of boys like Nicky Cruz. And I thought, now, Lord, that's pure religion and undefiled. And there's nothing in the world that brings such a sense of, of, of fulfillment as to be a part of this wonderful scheme of God's grace. And I thought, oh, Lord, if, with all the problems, this makes it worth at all. And I conjured in my mind, uh, maybe another Nicky Cruz, sending him to college. And, and one day, a man of God walking back in the street and saying, there's where God found me. And I felt so good. About 2 o'clock, or 2.30 rather, I heard a blood-curdling scream. My office opened to the main lobby. And I went to the door just in time to see Manny running out the door, throwing on his clothes, screaming like a wild man. I chased him down the block. He went down the subway. A train arrived, and he went off into the night. I missed the train. Went back to the center and asked them what had happened. They said, we don't know. He, just, he was sleeping. He woke up. He grabbed his clothes, screaming, and ran. The next day... I went up to Harlem, into the basement. He wasn't there. I looked all over, all over five or six blocks and finally found him in a little cafe, drinking a cup of coffee. He tried to run when he saw me. I said, Manny, look, why'd you run out on me? Come on, my car's out there. Let's get back. He said, no, sir, and I want you to leave me alone. He said, you did a terrible thing to me last night. I said, what do you mean? He said, listen, I don't have much left in life, but the little I've got left, you took away from me. And I, I thought of that calendar and a picture of his mother and, and uh, the candle. I thought, well, we could get that stuff if that's what he's relating to. He said, mister, and I'll never forget it, you took my security. I said, you're what? He said, my security. He said, that's just a, a, a hole in the wall to you. But he said, for four years, that's been my home, and I've grown accustomed to it. And to tell you the truth, I like it. He said, I like shooting drugs. I like living in that basement. Don't you understand? I didn't want to go with you. I was sick. He said, you fed me, that's nice, you're being a good man, you're trying to help people, that's fine. But he said, I don't want your help, don't you understand? You put me in new pajamas, in a clean bed, I hadn't slept in a mattress for years. He said, I woke up, I was so miserable, I felt my body was crawling with worms. He said, I was miserable. He said, please, don't you understand, I'm satisfied, just the way things are. And I had to walk out after an hour, he wouldn't listen, I, I couldn't believe what I was hearing. I got in a car and I shook my head and said, I don't believe it, how a kid can prefer a rat infested basement to the love we were trying to give him. And the tragedy is, friends, and this is documented in one of my books. Manny died six months later in the Brooklyn Hospital, cirrhosis of the liver. And I've never forgotten his face. You see, to me, Manny and Carla represent a whole new breed of sinner that, that we are uh, breeding in America today. I call the satisfied sinner. You see, the way I interpret my Bible, there are only two kinds of sinners, sorry sinners and satisfied. Now, David sinned grievously against God, yet he said, I repent of my sins. I'm sorry. I'll forsake my wicked ways. That's godly sorrow that leads to repentance. But you see, we have a breed of sinner in America now who, who, who won't come to Christ because they have the idea in their mind that some strange, mysterious power has overwhelmed them and they can't help it. They are a victim. You see, have you ever heard this? The devil made me do it. I couldn't help it. This strange, mysterious power keeps pushing me on. I don't want to be like this, but I can't help it. Now, I've prayed about this, friends, and the Holy Spirit's been saying some things to me I want to, hear, I want to say here tonight. First of all, there's no such thing as a victim of sin, only volunteers. Almost every drug addict that comes to us for help now has been to his local psychiatrist and he's had a perfect alibi given to him as to why he's a junkie. I had a 16-year-old kid come to me and I said, look, why does a 16-year-old kid stick a dirty needle in his vein? You're only 16 years old. You know better. He said, well, Mr. Wilkes, I'll tell you, it's very traumatic. He said, my problem is I've got interpersonal relationships, intensified anxiety states, and sibling rivalries. I said, who told you that? He said, my psychiatrist. He said, you see, Mr. Wilson, I can't help uh, what I am. I, I'm a victim of poverty. He said, I got caught up in the poverty syndrome. You see, I'd have preferred to have been born out in a nice suburb where there was love and a couple cars in the garage, but I got stuck in this ghetto, and I can't help it. I didn't ask to be born down here. This is where I've been put. I can't help it. Can't you see? Society put this on me. And friend, I can take you, I'm not about to tell you that poverty and unemployment and the ghetto are not contributing factors to dragging a soul down, but I can take you to Harlem and show you kids sleeping in hell.
His mom's a prostitute, dad's a drug pusher, brothers and sisters are all smashed and stoned on drugs, yet that kid's a man of God and he's going to go to Bible school and preach the gospel in spite of his environment. And I can take you right here to Denver, some of the most influential suburbs, and show you beautiful $100,000 and $200,000 homes with three, four, and five cars in the driveway, and parents who love their kids, and the kids going straight to hell in spite of their good environment. I'm a victim. Almost every man who, who cheats on his wife today and commits adultery becomes a fornicator. Instead of calling him by his right name, a fornicator and adulterer, we try to rationalize, we try to uh, dialogue with the problem and, and try to give him an excuse. And it goes something like this. Well, now, have you seen his wife? She's a witch. Well, if you were married to that, you'd run out and find somebody to understand you too. All the man wanted was somebody to understand him. And all the cheek in the world, and everybody said, all I want is somebody to understand me. Hogwash. Well, you city people don't know what that means. That's pig's food. I've been working with homosexuals for 20 years. We've had a home for homosexuals for 12 years now in upstate New York. A wonderful man of God, delivered from homosexuality, married now, a happy family man, and, and we baptized uh, this past year seven that have been delivered. And I believe that Christ is the cure, but friends, out of the thousands and thousands I've ministered to, only two out of a hundred have ever been reached or helped at all, because only two out of a hundred were willing to quit blaming somebody for their problem. Ask any homosexual, how did you become a homosexual? Mother did it. My mother did it. I had a mean father and I had a permissive, pampering mother. You just ask my psychiatrist, he'll tell you. Mm hmm. It's almost a sin to be a parent today. Mother did it. Dad did it. My friends, this, this is all over the country now. You remember this mass homosexual murder down in Houston? Twenty-five boys, little boys, were murdered and buried in cellophane garbage bags. And I have a film clip of the police digging up those bodies. And they just captured young Henley boy who had been a part of these murders and confessed it. And he's leaning over a police car talking on the phone to his mother. And before they even get the boy to jail, a psychiatrist is talking to reporters in Houston and saying, Now this boy is a product of a permissive society. We all made him what he is. He couldn't really help it. Not a one word about the stacks of pornographic smut they found in the boy's room. Not one word of the fact that he was an alcoholic. And not one word of the fact that he'd been going to sex orgies for years. No, we made him what he was. You know, all the time I have parents come to me to ask me to visit their kids in jail. And very seldom do I get an honest parent who comes and says, David, my kid did wrong. He got in trouble. My boy's in jail. He's paying for his penalty, his crime. But I love him. Go visit him, please. Now, I respond to that kind of honesty. But you know what I get? Almost all the time. Brother Dave, please go visit my boy in jail. Or my boy wouldn't hurt a flea. So help me, they're persecuting him. It's a communist conspiracy. It's Watergate. That's what it is. I am so sick and tired of Watergate. You know, we've got a man sitting down in San Clemente that is acting like a second savior for the United States, and we're piled up all the national conscience on one man who's sitting there, and I'll tell you, friends, there are more hypocrites and there are more false prophets in Washington doing more now than Nixon ever did making him look like a Sunday school picnic. And I'm so sick and tired of everybody blaming everything on one man. I'm not a Nixon man, but I'm telling you, every time somebody wants to shade their own hanky-panky, Watergate! Well, friends, let me say it again. There are no victims of sin, only volunteers. My Bible says, remember the words of the apostles, how they warned you. Men should become lovers of pleasure, covetous, disobedient to parents, drawn away by the lust of their own hearts sensuous, separating themselves, having not the spirit, drawn away by the lust of their own heart, not by a pusher, not by a hooker, not by a Watergate, wicked politician. Kids today who are smoking, drinking, running around and carousing and sticking needles in their veins are not running from somebody or something. They are following the lust and the dictates of their own heart. They're doing exactly what they want to do. The Bible said they're volunteers. Drawn away by the lust of their own heart. They're sensuous. Americans have become sensuous. And the Bible said they separate themselves. Well, you go to a local high school party, you know what the Lord's talking about, how they separate themselves. 
into their own little group. Why, well, I'm sure you don't go to high school parties, but I go wherever kids will listen. And you go to average high school uh, or college party today, and over here in one corner, all the potheads and the pillheads are all congregated, and they're all jiving on drugs. Now, you want jiving in, but, you know, and, and the shades, and always, if they're on pills or horse, they're pulling their nose and scratching their ears, and they're all jiving about drugs. See, they have a secret thing among them. They're all doing the same thing. They're all popping pills. They're sucking grass, and they're saying, hey, amen. I got me joined last night. Heavy man, heavy, 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 everything. Heavy man. And then over here in the other corner, all the six packers. Listen, you ask, you ask any high school kid in this place right now, the biggest thing in high school in Denver, Colorado, this state in the United States, is cruising and drinking, saving up money and getting enough six packs and go cruising. You go down to your town right down here now tonight and tomorrow, hundreds and hundreds of cars, teenagers just going back and forth, drinking Coors beer and throwing the cans out the window. Hey, you hear kids saying, I'm dropping out of society. You know how the kids drop out of society in 1976? In a $7,000 Dodge van with stereo. I wish I could drop out like that. Dropping out. Then over here in the other corner, all the spoochers and the petters. And they're looking around winking at anybody. You can always find your own kind. They're always around. And they connect. And they say, hey, this party's a drag that split. Get in the car, go to a local driving movie, crawl in the back seat and start making out. And that's exactly what the Bible says. They separate themselves. They're sensuous. They're drawn away by the lust of their own heart. And I've never been able to help anybody in 20 years until they say, this is my problem. And quit blaming somebody else and say, hey, look right in the mirror. In all honesty, say, this is a monkey on my back. I'm responsible. It's my problem. And quit blaming somebody else for what's happened to you. There's no strange power that's overwhelmed you. No, you were drawn away by the lust of your own heart. You're doing exactly what you want to do. Secondly, the satisfied sinner continues in his sin because he doesn't believe God will ever judge him. You see, he only sees the mercy side of Christ. Oh, how people love to go to church today and hear soft, easy preaching about thinking things through in a positive way. Everything is up, is coming, roses. And oh, how we love to hear about the sympathizing Jesus. Well, if I were a sinner and I had, if I had a hang up in my, I'd like to go to church and hear the preacher not jab me about my sin, but tell me how Jesus loves the sinner. And, and you see, that, that's a part of Christ. I've been preaching for 20 years up and down the streets of this nation around the world. I've been preaching mercy and love to sinners, prostitutes, harlots, and junkies. But friends, I know the other side. I know the goodness and the severity of God. But all there are a lot of sinners today like to hear of how Jesus, see, they picture Jesus as the he-man who understands that everybody should have a little weakness in their heart. The man who forgives heart, that's right on the spot, who goes around quoting from David, if God marked iniquities among us could stand, he knows our frame, he remembers that we're dust. Oh, how they like to see Jesus driving the money changers or the establishment out of the temple. They like to picture Jesus going to parties, turning water into wine. And all the wine gusses in America quote that at me, and Jesus turned the water into wine. Mm-hmm. And that wasn't grape juice, that was wine. Mm. Oh, the world today likes to hear about the sympathizing Jesus as if to say, well, Jesus understands this weakness in me. He knows I've tried and I can't help myself. So when I get before the judgment bar of Christ, he's going to understand that because he's loving, he's patient. He came to seek and to save the lost. He, and I'm one of those sinners that had a portion of his grace, but he knows that I just can't handle this. And oh, how we love to see this sympathizing side of Jesus. But there's nothing in my Bible that says Christ came to coddle sin. He loved the sinner, but he said he came to call sinners to repentance. But you see, friends, we're creating a wrong image of God on the American conscience. We've created in our minds through preaching from backslidden pulpits and through our permissive way of life in America. We have created an image of God who is weak, who allows hanky-panky, who allows anything to go as long as you don't hurt anybody in the process. As long as it's a personal problem and you're not hurting somebody else, you can live with it. And so, consequently, most people say, well, everybody's got a hang-up. I don't understand the kind of preaching in America that allows American conscience to believe that God is putting up with what we're having in America. 
to allow what happened in Dallas, Texas this past summer. You may or may not know that there's an all-homosexual church in America called the Metropolitan Community Churches. They now claim over 50,000 members. They've made application to the World Council of Churches. And the tragedy is that the United Church of Christ two months ago at their General Assembly voted to accept homosexuals as ordained ministers in the United Church of Christ. Three major denominations now have established study committees with a dialogue with the homosexual churches in view of ordaining homosexual pastors. Well, friends, they had their Holy Ghost Convention, they called it, in Dallas, Texas this past summer. 2,000 delegates. These are ministers from these churches and their delegates. They called it their Holy Ghost Annual Convention. Now, I couldn't go because they know what I stand for and they'd kick me out. So I sent my mother as an underground delegate. My mother is a great ordained minister of the gospel, and she loves people. She doesn't care whether you're homosexual, drug addict. She'll preach the same message in love. Now, friends, I believe in having compassion on homosexuals. I've preached that for years and more understanding in the church. But my message has always been as Christ is the cure, not an excuse. And that the church must never establish a dialogue with the doctrine of devils. But my mother brought back to me a tape recording of that convention. Now, I've never heard the Hallelujah Chorus sung with such enthusiasm. Power in the blood, I shall not be moved. And then to hear the evangelist stand and misquote from the, from the, from Romans. And you see, the indictment against the homosexual community has been Romans. And they changed that which is natural into unnatural desires and God gave them over to reprobate minds. But they say, that's not us. We didn't change anything. We were born this way. That can't be referring to us. That's someone else in society. And see how subtle the enemy is? Say, that's not you. You were born. You couldn't help it. You were created. You were a victim. So this does not point at you. And to hear the misquote, and I heard them say, God has delivered this generation to do as they please. You can be a homosexual. Come out of your closet and worship the Lord. You can talk in tongues. You can do anything and remain as a homosexual. And the thing that bothers me, friends, my mother laid on my desk blushing the registration packet she got. And every delegate got the same pack she got, 2,000 of them. You know what was in that packet? And this blows my mind. Uh, the course sheet and uh, program and two all-nude magazines of nude men and a list of all the gay bars in Dallas, Texas, so that after the meeting you could go out and get drunk and connect. These are ministers. You see, friends, what has happened to the American conscience, this kind of hypocrisy, we, be, we, are, we, we believe that God's going to let us get away with this, that we're on some fortress island. And God, when we reach the last point, that homosexuals is in Sodom flock that which is sacred and holy, that we can get by with it. And we've created in our consciousness in America the fact that God is so weak he'll not deal with sin anymore. There's another kind of hypocrisy, friend, that I don't understand. And these are parents who put their kids down for smoking pot, and they smoke one lucky strike after another. You know, there'll be a, uh, a story in the local newspaper about a drug bust in a local school. And here's dad and mom. They just had supper, and after supper, out comes the cocktail, and out come the cigarettes and the coffee. And they're all lit up, you know, and half stoned. And it goes something like this. Hey, honey, Puff, did you see Puff that thing in the paper, Puff, those... Crazy kids in high school, Puff, blowing that pot stuff, Puff. Man, dirty, filthy commies, Puff. What in the world does this world come to, Puff? We never did that, Puff, when we were kids, Puff. Suck. We never did that, man. What's the world coming to? Those crazy kids, Puff. Suck. Now, I watched some of you people coming in here tonight. You couldn't come in and listen to me for one hour till you lit up your cigarette. And you're sitting here now with a pack in your pocket or purse, and you're sitting here like a worm in a bucket of hot ashes, and you'd smoke right now if I'd let you. And you can't wait to get out of here, and you people who smoke are as hooked as any drug addict I've ever worked with. I, I would, and, and tell you, something else, hold, hold it please. You know, some, something else that bothers me, something that really bothers me, I call them puffin' prophets. Preachers who stand in the pulpit and say, kids, don't smoke pot, don't use drugs, Jesus can keep you clean. And those poor kids sit there scratching their heads and then so why can't he keep you clean? I was in a crusade recently and I noticed the chairman going lower low on his seat. I didn't know he smoked. He said, you sure got me in trouble last night preaching like that. My two teenage sons went home and threw all my pipes in the fireplace. I said, I tell you. He's, your kids are trying to say something for you. You may not think smoking or drinking is sinful. 
Well, we do. You want us to quit smoking pot? We want you to quit smoking cigarettes. What you're sucking is just liquid pot anyhow. And what we need in America is a good old-fashioned Holy Ghost mouthwash. That's right. We need parents who will quit being such hypocrites. All the hypocrisy of the American system. Now, I reach it everywhere. It's almost impossible for me to preach against drugs in the colleges and high school campuses because of parental and pastoral hypocrisy anymore. The kids will come back to me. You know, the United States government, for example, has one agency that says you can't advertise cigarettes on television anymore, and you advertise right on the packet. Surgeon General's determined smoking to be harmful to your health. Isn't that nice? Agency of our government saying don't smoke, it'll kill you. And another agency of the same federal government last year spent $133 million buying cigarettes for food for peace projects to send our cancer by the cart overseas. How do you like that for double standards? How about the school district in Mississippi a few months ago put out a rule that no high school kids could smoke on the campus for the whole district and the third morning they could be expelled. You know the hypocrisy of all? They just spent 30000 for a smoking lounge for the teachers. Hypocrisy. No wonder our kids don't listen. I say this, if you want to smoke and drink, that's between you and God, but you've abdicated your right to preach morals to your kids. Mm hmm Put that in your pipe and smoke it. Sure glad I got my offering. Now, look, friends, I'm not trying to be cute. I mean it with all my heart. I'm going to tell you another kind of hypocrisy. All you people sitting there saying, give it to them, Davey. Yeah, those smokers, those drinkers. I got something for you. And talk about television. Now, I know some of his old boy, he's a clothesline preacher. Now, he's one of those holiness preachers. Since one's holiness a dirty word. Now, friends, I don't believe in our, I believe in the imputed righteousness of Christ. I believe that when Christ comes into my life, he becomes my righteousness. He is my holiness. He does not put in me a seed of holiness. He is the holiness. He does not try to extract holiness from me. He has become my holiness and my righteousness, my justification, my sanctification. He's become all the fullness of the Godhead through Christ. But friends, I don't understand the hypocrisy. I've been warning American people now since 1973 when I put out a book called The Vision. I warned of a flood of filth in America. I warned of a flood of filth. Did you see this week's cover of Time magazine? The porno plague in America. I read it and wept. I've never read anything so powerful in my life. How America, and these are liberals who said, we don't understand what's happened. These are liberal, most liberal minds saying, this is not turning out the way we thought it would. In 1973, I warned American people that there was going to be a baptism of filth on America. And I saw the prophecy of the prophet Nahum coming to pass. Behold, saith God, I will pour abominable filth upon you. That doesn't mean that God has a reservoir of smut and filth stored up. No, the devil does, and the Holy Ghost has been the floodgates holding it back, restraining it. But now the restraining ministry of the Holy Spirit is being lifted because the world is clamoring for nudity and perversion and filth and smut and, and perversion. And God says, all right, that's what you want. That's what you'll get. You're going to be baptized with it. I warned Americans that there was a ship in a New York harbor with $10 million dollars worth of the worst smut to ever come out of Copenhagen. That's already just flooding the United States market. I warned that on television, after midnight, on cable, we'd have X-rated movies. Fifteen American cities now have X-rated movies. New York City is called the Blue, uh, the Blue Service, Blue Series. They have the same Blue Series up in Toronto. They have it in uh, 14 American cities now. Recently, the Devil Miss Jones and Deep Throat played on, on cable on a number of cities in America through college campuses. I had been warning Americans that we'd have full nudity on primetime television. Three weeks ago, NBC had their first full-time nudity and toplessness, and they called it a medical nudity. You see, they're coming in. It's called medical nudity. How to discover uh, cancer. And this was the first trial balloon. And now, friends, it's just opening an avalanche. And, friends, I've been saying all along that we were going to have programs that were programmed right in the pits of hell, and that programs like MOD... All the family, Mary Hartman, Mary Hartman, would compete with one another to put down everything that's sacred and holy and mock everything that's righteous. And the devil would like nothing better for American people to sit in their living rooms and laugh and mock at everything that's sacred and holy. 
You know what they're talking about now. They're talking about all kinds of subjects that were once taboo. And now anything goes. Cursing. Uh, I, I was supposed to be in Los Angeles a few weeks ago for the burial of Miss Catherine Coleman on Tuesday. And I couldn't make it. I had the flu. And someone called me. I was at home resting. And someone called me. Said, Mr. Wilson, please turn on Channel 5 right now. Now, on Channel 5 at 3.30, there's a program called Mary Hartman, Mary Hartman, that plays. And I turned it on. I couldn't believe it. They were mocking Catherine Kuhlman. There was a healer who was laying hands on somebody in a wheelchair, and the lady fell right out, and they did everything but name Catherine Kuhlman. And I, I, I wanted to scream because the irony of it is that that very hour they were burying Catherine Kuhlman. I said, God, the devil won't even let her get in the ground. On the Johnny Carson show, David Fry, the comedian, has learned to mimic Billy Graham. And at the end of his presentation, he got his hands and knees, looked right in the camera, and said, please send me all your money for my books and records and sermons. I want to be a millionaire. And the crowd went crazy, stomping. And Carson said, that's really funny. You see, if the devil can get us to laugh and to mock a spirit of mirth and frivolity. There was an earthquake the other day. I, I was in that earthquake that hit up there. We were in, in Kentucky Last week, when that five-state earthquake, I was on the 11th floor, and the building began to sway. And friends, it was a, a terrible experience. And especially that night, I was preaching on the judgment on America and how uh, the massive earthquakes are going to start coming. First, smaller than massive earthquakes. And you know the thing that really bothered me? I, I was going through uh, Memphis, where the earthquake had really hit hard, and on the front page of the commercial appeal was a whole section earthquake jokes. They were joking about it. You see, this is the very thing that I'm talking about. David said, the floods of ungodly men made me afraid. Friends, I don't understand how any Christian can even watch a program like Mary Hartman, Mary Hartman. I saw just that episode and a few flashes of two or three others. I said, my God, I can't even look at that. I don't understand some Christian ladies being so addicted to things like as the world turns. I had a, a preacher's wife recently say, Mr. Wolf, I had to quit for one reason. I found myself applauding, sitting there, urging on in my spirit and applauding divorce and filth. She said, I kept saying, leave him. Run away from him. She said, I found myself applauding and partaking vicariously. Watch. You say, oh boy, now we've got one of those preachers here who's going to preach against coffee next. I'm talking about the hypocrisy of it. And it goes something like this. There'll be a dirty, filthy movie coming on CBS. And the wife's in getting the coffee pot ready. And the husband's in there and he turns it on. And all of a sudden, there's the promo advertising the film. And there's a filthy scene. And it goes something like, hey, Mabel, quick, quick, quick. You'll never believe what's on television. Hurry, hurry, hurry. And so they sit there and say, My Lord, isn't that awful? What have we, just like Brother Dave said, isn't that awful? And for two hours they sit there watching the whole thing and say, Isn't that awful? What are we coming to? Oh, God, help me. Isn't that awful? Look, isn't that awful? And watch the whole brewing thing. Well, if it bothers you, and if it convicts you, turn it off. Don't be a hypocrite. And I'll tell you something else, friends. I'm not afraid of this baptism of smut. My Bible has a promise for every God-fearing man and woman that's built his house on the rock. If your house is in Christ and you believe Christ, there's a little knob there. It says off and on. And you're going to have to practice a little discretion from now on because you're being programmed right from hell now. You hear me? It's coming right out of the pits of hell. And you've only seen the beginning. They're going to start taking God's name in vain. Within the next three months, you're going to hear God's name taken in vain in major uh, prime time. God's name in vain now. Four-letter words. Absolute hell breaking loose in our TV twos. But thank God there's a promise for every Christian. Dad, Mom, you don't have to be afraid if all hell breaks loose. I don't care if all the demons in the hell are unleashed. I don't care if hell does enlarge its borders. My Bible said the man built his house upon the rock. And the floods came, the floods of filth and smut and pornography and perversion, and could not shake that house because it was on the rock. Thirdly, something the Lord has shown me is that the satisfied sinner 
is on the verge of committing a sin that is worse than the unpardonable sin. I'm going to preach something you've never heard in your life. I think it's worse than pardonable sin because it's self-inflicted. And it's more tragic than pardonable sin because God is willing to forgive, but man removes himself from God's reach. And it's called a reprobate mind. A reprobate mind. And because they refused to retain the knowledge of God, therefore God gave them over to a reprobate mind. A reprobate mind. Three places in the Bible. And God gave them over to the wickedness. God gave them up to their uncleanness. God gave them over to a reprobate mind. Do you know what a reprobate mind is? Have you ever met somebody with a reprobate mind? A reprobate mind is a mind that is sold out to a lie. A mind who has been telling itself a lie for so long it begins to accept that lie is the truth. And for this cause, God shall send them a strong delusion that they should believe a lie and may be damned to believe not the truth. Given over to a lie. Oh, how many people I have met that have been given over to a lie. I was at a crusade down in Newport News, Virginia, and a 15-year-old lad, about six feet tall, came a nice-looking kid. He was a drug pusher, and he needed help, so I took him to my ranch in Texas. And I had a, a five-hour counseling session with him one day, and I said, Bruce, why did you come forward crying like that in my meeting? He said, sir, you were talking about a reprobate mind. And he said, Oh, boy, did that hit me. He said, when I was 12 years old, I ran away from home and started selling pot and grass to my friends. And and for years, I was condemned about it. I thought, I'm ruining the lives of these kids. I'm messing up their minds. He said, but six months ago, the devil planted a little thought in my mind, just a little lie. Bruce, don't condemn yourself anymore. You're not hurting anybody. Don't you know that these kids are being helped through your drugs? Don't you know kids are seeing visions of God? They're getting scared of the devil? Don't you know that they're, they're becoming God conscious through drugs? You are a drug evangelist. You can go out and sell all you want from now on and congratulate yourself. You're doing as much good as any preacher. He said, David, I started going out selling drugs freely. No condemnation. And when I came to your meeting, I was convinced that God had called me, that my whole call in life was to go around selling drugs, opening kids' minds so they could have psychedelic revolutions and see God and angels and demons through drugs. He said, and I was almost convinced that that was my call in life. The reason I was put on this earth was to be a drug evangelist. He said, now that may seem crazy to you, but he said, I was believing that lie. And when you talked about being turned over to a lie, the Holy Spirit rebuked me for that. He said, the fear of God came on me and I ran down the aisle trembling. He said, David, if I hadn't come forward to your meeting, I'd have gone out and sold myself to this lie. I'd have been busted. That has sent me up for 30, 40 years, and I'd have been spending 30, 40 years sitting in prison saying, why? I didn't do a bit of harm. I was just helping. And he said, I tremble to think that I almost sold out to that lie. I was believing that lie was the truth. My wife and I counseled a young 19-year-old girl who fell in love with a married doctor in her city. He had three lovely children and a beautiful wife. And this girl said she was losing her mind. She said, I can't eat or sleep. This is tearing me apart. I love this man. I believe that God brought us together, but I don't want to hurt his wife, and I don't want to hurt those three precious little children. He, she said, and I don't know what to do. She said, I love him. She said, I, I love him so much. And we get together, and we pray and read our Bible, and I know that I minister to his spiritual needs. And she said, I, I know God brought us together. I understand him. His wife doesn't understand him, and I do. What am I going to do? And my wife and I sat there for two hours showing her from the scriptures she was living in adultery and fornication, that God would never appease it, that it was of hell, that she was being given over to a lie. And after two years, or two, two hours of preaching to her, when it was all done, we said to realize she hadn't heard a word we said. Because she said, I don't care what you say. Somehow, I believe God brought us together, and he's going to make it possible for us to stay together. What he, she was actually saying, I hope his wife dies so I can get him. That girl's going to wind up in a mental institution. She's given over to a lie. Nobody can reach her. Nobody can touch her. Her mind is shut. I met the worst reprobated minds in my life down in Mexico City. I went down for some crusades in the bullfight arena down in Mexico City a few years ago. And something powerful happened. See, in Mexico City, they have one of the world's biggest prisons. The Lucanberry Prison has over 5,000 inmates. And in the inner section, the security section, they have a security section with over 200 murders and rapists. And about eight, nine years ago, a Baptist missionary had distributed hundreds of my books across the Swiss Blade throughout the prison. 
And of all things, a revival broke out in the section where the murders and rapists were, and 26 got saved. And one of them took a correspondence, the Brian Bible study course, and became a licensed minister. Well, when they found out I was in Mexico City for crusades, they asked me to bring the crusade into the jail. And so I was happy to go. I didn't know all the story. I went through all these security gates, and the guard was saying, hey, man, where are you going? I said, the central security. He said, man, they got murders and rapists in there. I said, I know that's where the revival is. He almost had a coronary. He didn't know what I was talking about. I walked inside that last gate. They slammed it shut. Twenty-six men lined up. The pastor, Brother Delgado, about that tall Mexican in his mid-forties, I imagine, a Bible under his arm, smiled mirror to ear. Praise the Lord, Brother Dave. I got read, I got saved reading your book, The Cross and Switchblade. I'm pastor of the church. Luke and Barry, Berean Church. I want you to meet my associate pastor. These are my deacons. This is my mission secretary. These are my elders. Had a whole thriving church inside that prison. They, they put a table out in the courtyard and asked me to preach. I preached my heart out for half an hour. They gave an invitation. And I was heartbroken. Only five, six men came forward. I went around later. I stayed an hour or two to talk to the, these fellows. I never heard such reprobated foolishness in my life. One said, we don't need a preacher. We need a good lawyer. And every one of those men, they're going to die there. There's no way they're ever going to get out there for a life for murder, rape, and all kinds of armed robberies and things. And you know what everyone said? Well, we're going to get out of here. They thought either Castro would invade Cuba or, or would invade Mexico and set them free, or because they're in an earthquake zone, the earthquake would knock the walls down, or their case would be reviewed and, and they would be released. One man in his 60s, I'm getting out of here, and they're going to die there. Yet they're kept together by this lie. They live on a lie. Their minds completely close to any message outside of that little lie given over to it. I was in Florida, just finished the meeting, got in my car to go to the motel and to knock on the window. I rolled it down. And an 80-year-old man stuck his head in the window. He said, hi, David, I'm Joe. I said, Joe, am I supposed to know you? He said, yeah, Harkins Market, Braddock, Pennsylvania. Well, when I was a kid, 15 years old, I worked at a Harkins Market in Braddock near Pittsburgh. And there was a man by the name of Joe who lived on the block who used to shop there. And I used to preach at him every time he came in. He said, that's me. I retired and moved to Florida. He said, you know, David, I'm supposed to be dead. I had a terrible heart condition, and they did open heart surgery, took a vein out of my leg and put it in my heart. I've had a new lease on life. I said, Joe, were you in my meeting tonight? He said, yeah, and you preached at me again. I said, oh, you got saved. You came here to tell me. He said, no, sir. I said, Joe, I preached at you when I was 15 years old, years ago. And now I come full circle, and I'm preaching crusades, and I come to your city, you come to hear me preach, and there was enough conviction there tonight that you could touch it and feel it. And you didn't come forward? No, sir. I said, Joe, you should be dead in hell now, and you know it. Yes, sir. Are you ever, before you die, are you ever going to make Jesus Lord of your life? No, sir. I said, I got a couple old phony friends, and we drink a little and play cards, and he said, i got a philosophy at the end. Everything works out. I'm not like those kids you preach to. He said, I'm no junkie. I didn't hurt anybody. I didn't kill nobody. He said, I'm going to make it. Don't worry about me. That man's going to die and go to hell. And he's closed out. He just sit there while I preached amused. Just amused. Oh, how this hurts me. I can go up into Harlem, and I can preach to prostitutes and alcoholics, and they run to Christ. And I can go to churches where there are good nicks, I call them goodniks and smuggies. And they sit there smug in their sin. They've sat through 10,000 Jesus songs. They've heard a 1,000 Holy Ghost messages. They've walked out of a 1,000 Holy Ghost invitations. And they've grown hard in their hearts. And they're being given over to a reprobate mind. Now, if you sit here tonight and the Holy Ghost begins to prick your heart and you feel uneasy and you feel a pulling and a tugging, you can thank God that's the Holy Spirit still, still dealing and striving with your heart. But if you sit here tonight saying, well, nothing moves me, I feel absolutely nothing, I would say you're on dangerous ground because the Holy Spirit's here tonight. The Holy Spirit is here to save, and the Holy Spirit's here to heal and change your life. No, I, I believe this with all my heart. The coming of Jesus is right at the door. Some people call that the rapture. No, that term's not in the Bible. Some people call it the capture. That's not in the Bible either, so mine's just as good. I call it the evacuation. He's going to evacuate all the Jesus people in the twinkling of an eye. 
And friends, I believe that that moment's coming down upon us so fast. I believe it's right at the door. The Bible said right at the door. There's just a thin tissue between time and eternity. And friends, I don't understand how people, with this I'm going to close, I don't understand people who can sit in a meeting like this and stay satisfied with the way they are. The hardest people in the world to reach are those with, with, that, that are married and settled and, and, and they're at ease. And, and uh, they're good church people and they're good society members. And, and uh, they come to meetings like this and, and they hear me preach and they say, hey, that's all wrong. Or others will be convicted of their sin and my associates will come and say, David, you should have been out in the foyer as people were walking. Some of them were ash and white. Some of them were leaning on their friends and they go out in the cool air and shake off the conviction. I see it. I see it everywhere. And if I had my way, I would go up and down every aisle tonight, one by one, toe to toe, eye to eye with everybody in this building, up in the balcony behind me. And I'd point a finger with love right in your heart and say, are you really ready? Are you ready now? You know in your heart, God's put it in your heart. You know that the end of all things are near. You know that the thing is coming upon us now we've been preaching about for years. And yet people get up and walk out. I don't understand that. I don't understand that. I go home at night and I cry at my motel room and say, oh, God, I preach my heart out. There were people there living in their sin, hypocrites, phonies, 95 percenters who've given Jesus 95 percent, but they've been holding back. They've been cheating on God. And friends, one of these days, the Bible said every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess, and every eye shall behold it. You and I are going to stand before God. We answer for the message we hear. And I, I'm on a life and death mission now. I don't care what anybody thinks of my preaching. I've got nothing left to prove. I have absolutely nothing to prove. I've got no ladder to climb. I've got a pulpit always waiting for me on the streets. I'm here to tell you right now, the Holy Spirit has sent me here, and he brought you here tonight to deal with your sin. Be sure your sin will find you out. And God will not let you go out comfortable in your sins like you were when you walked in. God is dealing tonight before his coming with every one of us. I, I was listening to the news recently. And, uh, boy, they were talking about Lebanon exploding. They were talking about the danger of war in the Middle East. They were talking about the drought that's spreading in the Midwest. They were talking about this uh, indentation they found in California now. I don't know if you've heard about it from Palm Springs through Palmdale, right above the San Andreas Fault, about 100 miles. There's a strange indentation of the earth now, and scientists say that there's all kinds of activities in the San Andreas Fault. I always listen to all of these reports and I, I fell asleep in kind of a daze with these things ringing in my mind. And suddenly in the middle of the night, I had a beautiful experience. Uh, I was awakened and the presence of the Lord Jesus had flooded the room. Have you ever had an experience like that where you wake and suddenly the whole room was aglow with the presence of the Savior? Oh, his presence had filled the room. I tried to get up. It was just like a gentle hand pushed me back down. I started to laugh. I was exhilarated. I just... I was, I, I kept saying, Lord, you're in the room. You're here right now. You said you'd never leave us. You'd never forsake us. I sense your presence. I sense your presence. They that come to him must believe that he is, that he's a reward of those that diligently seek him. And Lord, I've been seeking you and I know you're rewarding me right now with your, uh, demonstration of your presence. You're in this room. And suddenly I began to realize that all I've been preaching about the coming of the Lord is about to happen. This is the generation that shall not pass. All these things come to fulfill it, my granddad preached it. My dad preached it. Now I'm the fourth generation of preachers in my family preaching the coming of the Lord. But friends, I am living, and the Lord made it so real, I am living in the generation that will not pass till it's all fulfilled. And suddenly, a revelation of God gets my heart. It's coming. We're nearing the hour. We're nearing the time. And suddenly, the nearness of the coming of the Lord, now only the Father knows that day. But oh, I, I believe the Holy Spirit was prompted my heart to this. All the signs pointed to it. And suddenly I, I thought of all the terrible things happening in the world and the chaos. I jumped up right in the bed. My wife must have thought I was having a fit. And I yelled at the top of my voice, I'm so glad I'm saved. Where will the people go now for comfort? Where do they go? I know what happens to me. When you hear an evil report, what do you do? You go to the secret closet. You turn it over to your faith. And you deal with it by the word. 
But where does a person go now? I put out a movie called Road to Armageddon. I told friends to go out and bite their neighbors. One lady went and knocked on her neighbor's door and said, would you come to uh, the church tonight and see a movie about Armageddon? She said, my goodness, no. She said, I'm so scared I'm not watching the news. Why in the world would I go see a movie about the end of the world? You see, the whole world sitting in fear. Oh, thank God. I'm saved. 